What's up, everyone? Welcome to Room and Board. My name is Chris George, and we have another Monday morning. And you would think that Monday.com would be sponsoring this weekly series after all the free publicity I've been giving them, releasing these on their day week after week, giving them that valuable brand recognition that they were lacking before crowdfunding countdown emerged. But when I reached out to their spokesperson, all I got was this cease and desist letter which breaks my New Year's resolution once again. That is 10 years in a row, but honestly, I've never gotten this far into the year without one. So I'm taking this as a win. <laughs> Baby steps. Now, unfortunately, Monday.com is not housing these videos on their site yet, but fortunately, we do still have another episode of Crowdfunding Countdown where we take a look at every single board game campaign finishing up this week and see if they've given us anything, anything at all, any reason at all to back them and pay the exorbitant shipping costs that will come with it. Anyway, first off, as always, shout out to my newest patrons. And now that that's done, let's get on with the week. <laughs> but seriously, shout out to all my patrons. Thank you so much for your continued support of the channel. You are all awesome. And I might forgive you for what you did to Rising Sun in that tournament. Maybe. Just Maybe. I never will. So let's get right into it because we have a very busy week. There were a ton of campaigns this week and a ton that I cut because they weren't any good. <laughs> but here's one that made the cut and that is Gigawatt. And first off, I would like to say that this is a colossal failure of a campaign or should be regarded as a colossal failure of a campaign since they are pronouncing it Gigawatt, one, and B, Nowhere in the campaign is there a reference to how much energy is produced by a lightning bolt. What's a gigawatt? But that aside, it looks all right. The basic premise of the game is to make sure that everybody doesn't die, <laughs> which is a pretty good goal. So you have to balance out when you shut down your coal plants and switch to sustainable energy, which can potentially cause massive blackouts across your entire energy sector versus not switching to sustainable energy soon enough and causing destructive climate change where the whole world is flooded and dies. Yeah. I mean, should seem like an obvious decision which way you should go. And that way is to never cause blackouts so that everyone can watch their Monday morning YouTube show. But actually the goal of the game is that the first person to shut down all of their coal plants wins the game. Obviously they did not take my advice. And there are some neat elements to this. Obviously a lot of your energy will be weather dependent. So you have to roll this weather die to see if it's sunny or if it's windy or if it's rainy. And that will obviously affect the amount of energy that you can produce, which I don't love that it's down to a die, but it does feel thematic in that way. You'll also be getting more and more technology cards at the beginning of each round, which have one-time abilities or multi-round abilities. Different power plants can be built for cheaper depending where on the map they're built. Solar needs a, you know, a nice view not in a forest for you to get the most value out of it. And there's some trading of power as well because you can't have a surplus of power and you can't have a shortage of power, but you can't have either. You need to just thread that line exactly right and then trade with your competitors or sell it to your competitors if you have that excess. And it looks good, but it also just makes me wanna play the game Power Grid instead which I don't really see any significant difference in the feeling of what the game is really going to give you. Even if Power Grid, the goal of the game is just to produce power at any cost with as much garbage as you can use, <laughs> or uranium, because what matters are the customer. The customer's always right. <laughs> but if this sounds interesting to you, check it out. They're also producing it completely sustainably. There will be no plastic components at all in the box, which I think is really cool. And I do think that this hits its goal of being a board game first and an instructive tool second, which a lot of games that deal with these sorts of instructable topics don't really always thread that line. And I think this does thread the line. Well, I could see this being a good board game and then it's secondary purpose of informing and instructing as well. But also I own Power Grid and I already like that a lot. And so at 49 euros or $68 Canadian, and then with pretty bad shipping on average 16 to 25 bucks to get it over to the US or Canada, the EU isn't as bad, it's like 12 euros there. I don't know, seems a bit expensive to me, but if you know a group of people, they are offering group pledges. You can reach out to them, you can contact them, get 25% off as long as you mention that room and board sent you. No, they, they offer it to everyone. I should start doing that though. But they only let, let you in on this deal 
if you say room and board sent you, they'll be like, who? <laughs> Who's that? Anyway, if you are interested, that finishes up March 30th at 3 a.m. And also funding in the early morning hours of Wednesday morning, we have an RPG called Tyrannosaurus Inside. And I don't usually cover RPGs on this channel because, well, there are too many board games to cover anyway. But I do want to mention this because this is an RPG that is set inside a T-Rex's stomach. And I just think that that is so funny. <laughs> And so if you do like RPGs, I think you should check this one out just based on theme alone. It's compatible with 5e D&D and Mork Borg, uh, because I know what that second system is. For sure I do. The theme is so good. They say no one expected a Tyrannosaurus to appear in the middle of this village, nor did they expect you. You, of all creatures, to slay the terrible beast. <laughs> I think the concept's fantastic. I have no idea if it's good or not but I do know it's a great concept. So if you are interested in that, that finishes Wednesday morning at 4.25 a.m. Now moving along, we have Tiwanaku, or the artist formerly known as Pachamama, whose tagline is, what if Minesweeper, Sudoku, Tectonic, and all the rest were just training so you could hope someday to win Tiwanaku? Just so you can hope. You had to play <laughs> all of those other games just to have a chance at winning against Geraldine. And they said they had to change the name for legal reasons. But then again, I heard that they knew how popular games that begin with T and endings that are insufferable to pronounce. <laughs> so my feeling is they changed it to capitalize on that trend. You're all being tricked! This is where in my notes I have tinfoil hat, but I'm also now strapped in. I'm attached to the camera on my lav mic, and I have to be in one specific position so that the lav mic doesn't go out on the fritz. So just imagine. Anyway, this had canceled. It was over on GameFound last October. It canceled October 26th, or that's at least when they put the update out. But it's back now, and I finally get to talk about it, which is... Again, proving why this is a good way to go about Kickstarters, because there are too many games and too little time to invest in something that is not going to fund. But this is funding now, and I'm sure that it makes the creators proud chapapas. What I do love is that they are keeping this campaign exciting by including a little puzzle to solve in every update. So not only does that keep you coming back to the campaign page and coming back and thinking about the game, but it also allows you to solve little puzzles around the game, imagine yourself playing the game, see if you even like these sorts of puzzles and doing them once every day, and kind of serves as a nice litmus test as if you will enjoy this sort of deductive nature that this game is. And I think that's great. This is primarily a deduction game. And each game you're gonna have a scenario that will be revealed over the course of the game as you take your little meeples and explore the lands. And whenever you step into an unexplored space, you'll flip over a new terrain tile. And depending on what terrain tile you uncover, you move up in a track and you get points the more of that specific terrain type that you have uncovered. But then you also can get points by divining where the crops will be, because each land also has a certain crop that is associated with it. And you'll get points from crop level 1 to crop level duster to crop level 5. But whenever you need to reveal something, you will turn to this disc, and you'll then pull a little door and it'll show you. You'll line up the symbols on the grid where that particular point hits, and you'll reveal a door and it'll show you exactly what symbol should be on that spot. I think this mechanic in terms of how this information is relayed to the player is pretty ingenious and feels like it will keep the game moving along. And so the deduction element is generally determined by the knowledge that every single region, and a region is comprised of adjacent tiles of the same type, every single region will have one of each crop starting at crop number one, crop two, crop three, up to crop number five, if there are five spaces in that region. So you know if you only have a two space region, there will be a crop one and a crop two somewhere in there. So it becomes easier to figure out which is where, because also two crops cannot be adjacent, even diagonally, to each other. So that's how you're gonna kind of map out the game, is through these regions and these placements. And that's why the Minesweeper and Sudoku comparison I think is very apt. You're uncovering spots and you're hoping to flip over the right tile and build a sort of information and then capitalize on that by getting points. Because if you divine the correct crop, you also get additional resources that you can then sacrifice for 
extra points as well. And once the whole board is unveiled, the game is over. Now, I fear this would make for a less interesting conclusion of the game, but I'm hopeful that the deduction aspect is satisfying enough while you play it that that doesn't matter because if there's only one spot left, you know the amount of tiles that are in the game. That's part of the deduction element. You're gonna know what it is and you can either trigger it or everyone should know at that point about the same information. And they're looking into having a web app to give you constantly rotating scenarios so you don't actually have to deal with that disk because people are afraid of variability. And I understand the fear of variability in deduction games. I Cryptid is one of those games that also has a web app in case you go through the stack of cards this big. But the thing is, when everything is mixed up together and you aren't keeping track of the scenarios that you've played, you're not going to likely remember unless you're playing this non-stop over and over and over again. So I think the fear there that these scenarios will become stale and the game will become unplayable is an unfounded one. Now, even still though, this is the deluxe version. This is going to be more expensive now than it is at retail. So if you love wood and screen printed stuff on your wood, check this one out, but it is still expensive. It's 54 euros, $75 Canadian. However, if you do live in the US, the shipping there is fantastic at six bucks. And that is included for all you EU people out there. So there are a lot of positives to this campaign and it looks like a fun deduction puzzle, but really you need to gel with that sort of Sudoku discovery or else I don't think you'll enjoy it. But if you are interested, that finishes up on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Now, next up, we have a game called Village of Legends, or more specifically, the Aldhara expansion. And this is just an expansion to the original game, and it's a deck builder with some cool looking art. If you were scrolling along through Kickstarter, this is what it is. <laughs> Don't bother clicking, I've clicked for you. <laughs> and it is a deck builder where you are going to fight the other opponent to the death. So it reminds me a little bit of Epic Spell Wars Annihilageddon. Although honestly, I think that one looks a little bit better. But in this one, they do have these extra campaign books that you can buy, which allows you to play this cooperatively as well. So maybe that's something you're interested in. However, this campaign does drive me a little crazy because there's no way to get the base game or the base game without every single expansion. And I don't know why people do this on Kickstarter. Maybe people will be interested and find your game who haven't heard of it before. I have never heard of your game before. I am not interested whatsoever if you're gonna make me buy the entire package because nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, it's likely not worth it. You'd have to get everything for the absurd 86 euros or $116 Canadian, and I'm not going to take a risk on an unknown game for that price point. Even if that might be kind of a deal because you get four expansions in it, you're not showing me the contents of these expansions, and you even have in your base pledge with the expansion that says, hey, if you wanna get the base game, throw it in as an add-on. And then when you go to your add-on sections, it's not listed whatsoever. So either you're a liar, or your campaign page is so unorganized, why should I expect your game to be anything different? But it makes it easy for me, cause we can now move on. <laughs> Don't worry about this one. But if you'd like to check it out, that's Wednesday at 3 p.m. Now, next up, we have Pop-Up Chess, and this won't fund, it's 50% at its goal. And this is the only one on this list that isn't funding right now, but I thought it was cool, <laughs> and I wanted to talk about it, because I do think this is kind of a novel idea and for a decent price point. It's pop-up chess, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I don't really have anything else to say. If you're tired of taking your chess board out and not being able to finish a game, now you can. <laughs> a miracle has occurred. <laughs> and I do love that their video recognizes this. They're like, ah, we've shown you all there is to offer in the first four seconds. What do we do with the rest of this time? I guess we just fold and unfold it over and over. And Look, there's different arrangements pieces on the board. Look how much they're stopping and starting. <laughs> but I think this could be cool if like you really like playing chess at lunch and it's a decent price point. It's 12 euros or $20 Canadian. And if you are a chess aficionado, I think it's kind of novel. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. Even though it's not gonna fund, I still think it's kind of smart. Maybe they should have been showcasing these pieces instead and they would have gotten a bit more funding. But if you are interested in that, hey, you can donate the next 50% and make it happen by Wednesday at 6.02 p.m. Now, next up we have a game called The League 
of Dungeoneers. It's not the League of Dungeoneers, it's League of Dungeoneers. I almost said the League of Villains, or the Evil League of Evil. But League of Dungeoneers, nailed it, first try cut the other, other parts out. This is a huge solo or co-op dungeon crawl game with heavy RPG elements. That's how it's being pitched towards you. They're saying that it's mostly a character-driven game. It's focused on your characters and leveling up your heroes. You have over a hundred talents and perks to customize your character as they level up as you go through these randomly generated dungeons. And that's their breakdown. That's pretty much what has raised over $300,000. 300,000 euros, rather. And the promise of this campaign sounds really interesting. I also really like that they are going as bare bones as bones could be. They want as few bones as possible. It's the opposite of too many bones. They want too few bones, but still being able to stand up. Because you can add these character sheets to your pledge, or you can print them. You can add standees to your pledge, or you can use miniatures that you already have. So they're not in, even including the standees in the base box. You can, you can buy them and add them on for an extra 16 euros, or they're expecting you to already have these sort of stock character minis that maybe you've already painted and want to use instead. So depending on how you feel about that approach, that might be great. You may want a game that allows you just a sort of structural framework to go through random dungeons and level up a character because that's what it is. This is all just divine from their campaign page because they do not have a rule book available. They don't even mention if there will be a story, and I really believe it's just going to be random dungeon after random dungeon, getting your characters to a, as high a level as they can go. So it's 63 euros or $87 Canadian, but that is the base base game. If you want the minis, again, you need that 16 euros. The character sheets printed out, they're four euros. So there's all these little bits and pieces that if you want to have a complete game just with this, it's gonna cost you a lot more than it first may seem. If you want those cool doors that open and shut, which I assume you can interact with on the board, but again, they don't have a rule book, well, <laughs> you can buy those as well. If you are interested, that does finish up at Thursday morning, 6 a.m. Now, next up, we have a game called Small City Deluxe. And if you thought that the small city portion of the game would provide you its price point, you're wrong. It's the deluxe that should indicate how much you're gonna spend. But this game does look fun. Their breakdown in the rule book says that you're a deputy mayor in charge of a small borough of small city. A city renowned for its progressive election system, which collects votes eight times a year, truly embracing the slogan, vote often and vote early. Therefore, you have eight turns to secure enough votes to get yourself to be the next mayor. And I think this breakdown is so funny. It's such a funny way of describing how you get your victory points thematically and why they're not just victory points. And so you want to get those votes, and you'll do that by expanding your city. Green residential buildings, or yellow industrial buildings, or blue commerce tiles. I mean, they say it's based off of SimCity, but it's sounding an awful lot like suburbia without the unique building powers. But basically you'll get points by placing citizens in your residential areas and points in a variety of other ways while also managing your pollution, which I think is a neat track to manage because there's no use of being mayor of smoke city. You want to be mayor of small city instead. And so basically the structure of the game is you're going to pick an action at the beginning of the round, there'll be eight action cards laid out, and whoever goes first gets to pick an action, and then everyone else gets to pick an action right beside the person who went first. Or you can pay money to expand it a little bit further from where they were situated. So I think that way of choosing action cards is neat, and then you get that special action power, which is stuff like get a discount on building, your standard things that you would expect action cards to be. The rule book's okay, it's a work in progress. Some of the rules are just dumb and unnecessary. They say, oh, everyone decides where the mayor meeple will go on one particular person's sheet or, or grid because the mayor goes on a mayoral parade in one of the boroughs and everybody decides that. But if you can't decide, then it's the previous person who had the mayor who decides where it goes. Well, that's just the previous person who was the mayor decides where it goes. If I was previously mayor, I'm saying it's going there. And then someone else says, ah, I want it to go there. And I say, okay, let's go to the tiebreaker. Oh, it's going there. It's just a useless <laughs> step in the process. I think they mean it to encourage discussion and saying everyone else can chip in their opinion, but like, 
No, but unfortunately it does look fun. The price point is a little high. It's $69 US, $87 Canadian. In that case, just go get Suburbia, honestly. That should scratch the same itch. Or if you want a game about having a bunch of people in different boroughs and have a more cutthroat mayoral race, well then just go for Tammany Hall. But if you are interested, check it out. It does seem solid. That finishes at Thursday morning, 6.18 a.m. Now, next up we have Solar 175. And this is by the team of Kohito Ergo Meepo, who I didn't know they actually designed games. I found them back on YouTube, back when I was just starting out on YouTube. They had a great series about the history of Monopoly. It was really fascinating, as well as a few other interesting videos about mechanics and deep diving into mechanics. And honestly, this is a game that I want to look favorably on just because of that. Because judging by the attention to detail in their videos, I think it reflects an intelligence and a passion for this hobby, which, yeah, I want that in a game designer. Plus, throw in people comparing it to Orléans and that it's a legacy game. That's usually enough for a tertiary. Thumbs up looks good, let's move on. <laughs> to our bazillion other games this week. But that's not enough for me. Plus the rulebook looks like it's 56 pages, but it's actually only 26 because the rest of it is just legacy stuff and stuff that you will unlock at the beginning of your campaign. And the bones of the game are actually quite simple. So this is billed as a legacy game, but nothing will be destroyed, which as somebody who has just started a campaign of betrayal legacy with a bunch of heathens who take great joy in ripping the cards right in front of my face, ripping pieces of my soul as they do so, I appreciate that nothing will be destroyed. <laughs> and I like this because it's basically the game is just getting more complicated as you progress. You'll learn the rules slowly, but if you did want to start again at the beginning, you would need a recharge pack. So you know what that means? Stickers. <laughs> Anyway, the goal of each game is to gain the highest amount of influence in the galaxy. And you're gonna do that by a number of things, but mostly building a bunch of outposts on different parts of the galaxy. And when somebody builds all of their outposts, the end of the game is triggered. Now the comparison to Orléans is very apt because you will be pulling your workers out of a bag You'll start with four workers and then assigning them to different spots on your personal player board. And once all spots of an action are filled, you then get to take that action and your people go off to the side and then they'll go back into the bag. So in Orléans, they go right back into the bag. This one, you will cycle through your entire bag. So you have a little bit more predictability on what you will draw, but that's the basic loop. And then you are using those actions to get influence on this map this solar system map that's just created with cards with a side A and then I assume will flip to a side B at some point during the campaign. There's a couple other interesting things that happen, my favorite being the voting phase that they're highlighting. Because instead of using your workers and then putting them back into your bag, you can put your workers in other spots, do more powerful abilities, but then they go away forever to live in a farm somewhere up galaxy. <laughs> and one of those things is to cast a vote for which faction will win the election. And depending on which faction wins the election, certain victory conditions are worth more points at the end of the game. So if you've really been stockpiling and you know who's gonna win the election, then you know what to be focusing on throughout the game and you don't have to have that sort of broader attack. Now it looks cool, but it is also very, very expensive. It's 67 pounds, $89 US, $117 Canadian, and that's just for the retail version. You don't get any of the stretch goals, which why are you on Kickstarter if you're not for those sweet little stretch goals? Oh, you're speaking my language, I love the stretch goals. I mean, goals. sometimes, sometimes he's right, I guess. So that's the base or it's 84 pounds, $139 Canadian for the stretch goals and fifth player expansion, or it's $154 Canadian for the even more blingier stretch goals, <laughs> more metal on metal. And so I like Orléans, I really do. I, I think it's a really fun game. And this feels fun in the similar way. And I haven't even touched upon all the narrative elements that they add. I think each planet has their own little backstory too. And I can't touch on that because I've spent too long in this segment already, but obviously, you know, that's too expensive for me. Maybe it'll be worth it for you. If it is, check it out. That finishes Thursday at 11 a.m. Now, next up, we have a game called Word Explosion. And I was so high off Illiterati last week. That was exciting. I was excited to see another word game. Maybe you were too as you were scrolling through Kickstarter. 
but this one is just word, letter, uno. Okay, it's not, but it basically is you play a letter that matches the letter in the pile of cards, or you play the next letter of the alphabet, or you just ignore all of that and play a word. <laughs> I mean, so it's better than uno. I would play it. But I was so hopeful that this would be an awesome word game, and I just feel deflated looking at it. But at least it makes for a quick segment. 22 bucks US, $28 Canadian, way too much for what it is. So we're moving on. If you are interested, that does also finish at Thursday at 11. But I am thankful to Word Explosion because it made me so deflated and upset that I just cut out a whole bunch of games that I was gonna talk about this week. Because honestly, they sounded truly horrible and not in a fun way. Can't we just all take this time and reminisce on the joys that a perfect campaign like Rallyman Cars gave us? Now that was a campaign worth getting excited about. So if I have skipped a few this week that you wanted me to talk about, make sure to write it in the comments below and I will uh, tell you what I think because sometimes I do miss things but sometimes I miss things on purpose, and uh, there were quite a few this week that were missed on purpose. So just assume, if, if I don't talk about it, it's gotta be, it's gotta be pretty bad. Except that one, that one diamond in the rough that you love, and I'm excited for you to get. <laughs> okay, let's actually move on. And move on to something that I know that people are excited about. It is the expansions to Sentinels of the Multiverse, the definitive edition, the first expansion for this new definitive edition of Sentinels of the Multiverse called Rook City Renegades. And I didn't know how many expansions this game had until I watched Professor Meg's Top 10 over on Quackalope's channel, and I saw that giant, larger than Gloomhaven box filled with multiverse stuff. So I assume this is the beginnings of new releases that will only replicate the best of that. And it's cool, if you love the game, you may want to back this. It's filled with a new mechanic. A suddenly card that you flip over and it immediately does something. I'm not sure why that is a new mechanic, but it, I guess it's new to the Sentinels of the Multiverse system. And you get six extra heroes and nine more villains. And sure, it might be a good expansion, but here's the thing. I can get Sentinels of the Multiverse, the definitive edition, at 401 Games here in Canada for $50 Canadian. Instead of the $70 US plus shipping that they're trying to sell it to you as an add-on to their campaign. Are the promo cards really worth that much? This isn't a Dice Tower Kickstarter here. Enough is enough. We are in it for the gameplay. And that is just objectively a horrible, horrible deal. Just print the card on some paper and staple it to your <laughs> least favorite multiverse card. Although I guess you would see it coming up with the staples as you draw for your deck and you get cut. Yes, in this world also the staples are unable to, get to be closed and they puncture your hand anytime you draw the card. But honestly, it's worth it for the savings. But seriously, it's like they're billing this package and these promo cards as greater than the games themselves. There's nothing greater than games. Who do these people think they are? Oh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? Anyway, so this is a cool system, but just wait for retail. Or get the retail edition if you're looking for another co-op deck builder. I love co-op deck builders. I'm sure this is one I would enjoy trying, but I would hate myself even more than I do on a daily basis if I spent the Kickstarter prices to get it. And honestly, props to Greater Than Games, they say outright, they're like, listen, hey, you don't have to buy this on the campaign. We just threw it in because people were asking for it. Buy it from our web store or support your local game store. And then they just have to have it as 70 bucks on their web store because I guess that's their MSRP and it doesn't look great for a company to be undercutting themselves. Retailers can do it, but companies can't. Anyway, if you are interested, check it out. That's Thursday at 4 p.m. Now, next up, we have a game called Library Labyrinth where you get to build a team of amazing fictional and historical women to put escaped literary terrors back in their books. Can Athena and Marie Curie defeat Dracula? Yes, yes, the answer is, the answer is yes. Or could Little Red Riding Hood and Harriet Tubman capture a Kraken? Also, yes, for sure, no problem. Or you can even play as Sheldon Cooper's favorite character, Queen Nzinga. It's, it's the lowest of low-hanging fruit. But I know some of you out there love the Bing Bong Boys. Anyway, if you've played Forbidden Island or Pandemic, it's very much like that. You're in this library. On your turn, you can take actions which are 
flip up tiles to explore more of the library, rotate tiles of the library so you have pathways to get to places, trade a card with another player, go to one of these abominations or krakens and play the cards written on the little token to capture them and then bring that back to the shelf where they belong. And you have to shelve six monsters, and if you do, you win. I really like the theme. I love that the characters are all strong women. Fighting down these literary characters, I just don't really like Forbidden Island, and that's what it really gives me, vibes of that. Now this is 29 pounds or $48 Canadian, and I also think after the shipping, which is like 12 to 14 pounds on average, it's just not, it's just too much for what it is. And this is also one that I forgot about completely. I mean, I've been working on this research all day and I'm filming this this night. And so I, I looked at this today and then I got to this in my notes and I thought, what is Library Labyrinth? <laughs> and I didn't remember until I read on, so. I'll attribute that to my own sort of tiredness and lack of enthusiasm with Forbidden Island, let's say. But if you are interested, hey, check it out. I think the theme's awesome. And I think that's what a lot of people are saying, which also often doesn't reflect the best because it's sometimes a similar thing to people saying, well, you looked like you were really having fun up there when they can't think of anything else to say. So take that for what you will. <laughs> anyway, if you are interested, that does finish Thursday at 5 p.m. Now, next up, we have Malaya, Lands of Legend, whose tagline is a cooperative and narrative adventure game. Live the thrill of land crawling, dungeon crawling, infiltration, riddles, and more. <laughs> and I am very glad that they specified how they are innovating the genre, because it's no longer just dungeon crawling. Don't worry. You won't be only in a dungeon, which would certainly disappoint my Uncle Larry. He loves his dungeon. He's constantly inviting strangers down there, and yet when I try to go in there and play on his swings, I get reprimanded and sent upstairs to bed without any supper. So at least in this, you have land crawling. We can live the thrill of land crawling. Now I will say this is one where you should absolutely go all in because all of the expansions I feel are essential I don't normally suggest this sort of thing, but how else are you going to be able to live the thrill of boat crawling, or mountain crawling, or swamp crawling, or Uncle Larry's funhouse crawling? Essential expansions. <laughs> but really, this is another sprawling narrative campaign, where you level up your characters with over 100 hours of gameplay, with some fun minis, although there doesn't seem to be a ton of them. And it's something that does look neat that I also have zero desire to ever play. <laughs> I think I might be past the campaign game genre craze. I mean, I don't even have time to play through a 40-hour video game campaign by myself. How am I going to organize a 100-hour campaign with people that I also need to prey upon constantly <laughs> to help me review games? And so the prospect of spending 140 euros or $190 on this thing that isn't Iridia, although it does have the same number of Ys in it, that feels a bit overwhelming in terms of the amount that you'll have to sink into it. And it's a tough one because this one also does have a couple neat mechanics. I also really like that there is a stealth system in this. That's two weeks in the row where I get to imagine being a sneaky little boy, which is always a good thing in my books. And honestly makes this feel more like Skyrim the board game than Skyrim the board game did. It also reminds me a little bit of Harakiri with the land phase and the dungeon phase, because you are going to be crossing this map and exploring different stuff up top and then accessing those scenarios and going to the dungeon, basically. But otherwise, I also don't see that it's doing too much to innovate in this particular genre. And it's kind of just relying on the backs of other dungeon crawlers that have innovated in the genre, like Gloomhaven or Aridia or Bumblebees of Dumbledore, which I think used to be the title of the third Fantastic Beasts movie, but they had to change it because they didn't want to get any legal issues from the game. Anyway, if you are interested and you need to have more of that large, sprawling dungeon crawl because you love it, check this one out. Absolutely. This one finishes at Thursday at 5.59 p.m. Now next up, surprise, this isn't a board game, but of course we have to take a moment to talk about the most funded Kickstarter project of all time, the Pebble Watch 3. This time, it's just a box of sand. 
Sorry, no, it's Pebble Watch 4. No shoes, no shirts, no refunds. <laughs> okay, fine, it's Brandon Sanderson's four mysterious books and eight months of Sanderson swag. Now, Brandon Sanderson is a fantasy heavyweight. He's written so many books. I uh, don't even know if I can call myself a fantasy enthusiast since I haven't even read one of them. I'm more of a Guy Gabriel K guy or Patrick Rothfuss or, you know, Neil Gaiman. He's still fantasy. Or back in my youth, R.A. Salvatore. I loved the Crondor world back then. But this is an enormous price point for four books. It's $160 US, $200 Canadian to get four books. And these books, they're going to look gorgeous. They're, they're going to be the best books anyone's ever seen. They're going to be leather bound. They're going to be, you're going to pull them off your shelf and they're going to open and sparkles will shoot at you. You've never seen such great books. So if you do love your book collection, hey, this might be worth it to you. It doesn't feel like something that you want to back on a whim when you could just go out and buy a Brandon Sanderson novel that you haven't read because he's written hundreds of them. <laughs> no, okay, not hundreds. That's an exaggeration. But I know the Cosmere saga could, at the end of it, have 40 books. That's what he's quoted as saying. And three of these books take place in the Cosmere universe and then one is different and special. Or if you want to get the extra monthly swag boxes, which honestly sound like a heck of a lot of fun, it's going to cost you $360 US or $450 Canadian to get them to you. Plus the shipping it works out to be about $40 a month, which may not be super extravagant for a subscription box. You're just trusting that you will enjoy whatever the secret they've provided you. If you like book-related loot boxes, Check out this one called the Fairy Loot Box. Oh, it looked pretty cute. I've seen some YouTubers uh, unbox that before. Anyway, don't watch this video. I know I've had it playing. He's very charming. He makes me want to buy it after he pulls out these stacks of paper over and over again. When I could just go read the book by Brandon Sanderson that I got for my girlfriend for Christmas that I haven't yet read. But thus is the allure of Kickstarter, I suppose. And I think it's awesome that we have something nerdy as the number one funded thing of all time. I think it's gonna make it very hard for any board game to surpass this number, whereas they might have dethroned the Pebble Watch. But if Frosthaven wasn't gonna do it, I don't know what was. So it's really cool that this has raised so much money. It is mind blowing to me. But if you are interested in getting on board, that finishes Thursday at 7 p.m. Let's keep it going. <laughs> From the people who brought you Catacomb, or what my friends lovingly refer to as, ah, uh, that, uh, that flicky game, comes Monster Pit, a new game that is in the catacombs world without the flicking, aka they just didn't want to pay for new art and also capitalize on the brand recognition that being in this other world gets you. So let's just reuse all the same art and call it a day. <laughs> There's a monster in it ties in thematically. <laughs> and this one seems okay. I, I like Elzra Games. They're Canadian companies, so I, I like that especially. And actually, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, gave them a shout out as a Christmas gift to buy. He was like, yeah, support a Canadian company. Uh, Elzra, get their, um, uh, what is that? But the Catacombs game. I don't know if he's actually played it or not, but it would be cool if he did. Anyway, we're not talking about Catacombs, which I own and I enjoy. We are talking about Monster Pit, and this one seems okay. You're gonna roll dice, and you're gonna either have a captain result or a monster result, and you're gonna get good things on the captain results and bad things on the monster results, basically. And it's cooperative, so you're going to send your people to various locations, and they're gonna get to do various things, and then the monster is gonna roll and move forward towards the capital. If it gets to the end, it automatically breaks through the doors and you lose. And so you do have to visit these places and get different power-ups and power up your dice so that they're better because the white dice have four captain symbols on them and the red dice only have two captain symbols on them. So if you like rolling dice, you might like this. I think I'd rather spend my time playing catacombs rather than invest in this new system. And they say you can let one person play as the monster in this and that just seems, I don't know, it seems unbelievably boring. I, I feel like this should be strictly a co-op game or solo game, whatever. But if you are interested, it's $67 Canadian plus $14 Canadian for shipping. It feels better when you're getting a bunch of wooden discs that you know you're gonna have to flick versus dice and some cards. I don't know, maybe that's just for me. But if you are interested, that finishes Thursday night at 11.30 p.m. 
Now, speaking of dice, we have another dice roller. It's called Dragon Quest, and this is kind of a roll and write by Queen Games. Well, okay, less of a roll and write, more of a roll and roll and roll and draw a line from one side of your board to the middle and then to the exit. <laughs> and this is, seems fairly simple. Hey, if you like rolling dice and you thought you were going to get monster pit, well, <laughs> save your hard-earned cash for this one, because you get to roll movement dice to move to the treasure chamber. And you're going to try to steal something valuable in the middle and then get out before you die a horrible dungeon death. But you also roll the treasure dice to see how many treasure you pick up along the way. And then you roll skill check dice when you encounter various traps. And then you roll to see if your way is blocked by a monster. And then you roll battle dice. And then you roll damage dice. And then you roll and roll and roll yourself down the nearest hill. <laughs> in a garbage can. There's a lot of dice here. <laughs> so if you do like rolling dice to determine literally everything in a game, then this is the game for you. If you want another push your luck style game, again, that is what this, this is. Because you're pushing your luck how much time you do spend in the dungeon trying to scoop up treasure before you do jump out the exit. So this might be one to check out. I know that Queen Game stuff often finds its way to retail still though. But this one may not because it doesn't look like it has a huge backing behind it. So it's $35 US, $44 Canadian, and then shipping's absurd, $16 to $22 on average. So I just wait. I would wait for it or just play Yahtzee. <laughs> but if you are interested, that does finish 2 p.m. Friday, April 1st. Now, next up, we have Catapult Feud, the Ukraine edition. And Catapult Feud, I covered it fairly recently. I can remember it fairly recently. It's just a game about flinging your catapult balls at the other person's tower, trying to knock them down, win. Looks looks like it would be pretty fun for kids. And so this one company, they got the distribution rights to distribute it in Ukraine. And as you know, it's not a great time in Ukraine right now. And so basically since the start of the war, since February 24th, their office and warehouse has been turned into a relief center. And in fact, the people who are behind bringing the games to Ukraine, they're no longer in Kiev. They've been able to move their family out and are in a spot that's a little bit safer, which is great. But the campaign page, they're right. They're, they have no idea when they will be able to return. And so the, there are even some games that could arrive to Ukraine, but obviously no games are coming in right now because there's a literal war happening. So they're saying that you can purchase a game and the proceeds will go to help rebuild their infrastructure, basically. Or you can just donate a copy to someone in Ukraine and the pledge rewards will go to a child in Ukraine. So you can do that. Or you can get yourself a copy. The rulebook will be in Ukrainian, but it's a language independent game. So you could really just look up a rulebook online and realize, oh yeah, we're just flicking little balls at each other and having a good time. So yeah, if you're looking for another way to support, I mean, the war in Ukraine sucks. The war in Syria sucks. That's still going on. War in general sucks. <laughs> Unless, of course, it's on a board with a bunch of cool plastic figures. But really, Vladimir Putin is a steaming pile of human garbage. So f*** you, Putin, for even making this a campaign that has to happen. Your mere existence is a stain upon this world. You moose and squirrel wannabe. You flat, smushed, pale-faced, rejected Muppet balloon. You uncivilized pizza burn on the world's mouth. Gum in the hair embodiment of a rat's anus. I heard Putin is the type of guy to wear shoes in your house and pajamas in the street. I even heard that he steals the seats from pregnant women on the bus. I don't know, I just looked up on Yahoo Answers how to insult a Russian person, and those those were the things that came up first. And Yahoo Answers always knows. If you want to know if you are the mother of your child or if your boyfriend has been cheating, just go to Yahoo Answers. They'll help you figure that question out. Ah. There's no good way to end this segment. Might as well just try to end it with a couple jokes. Anyway, let's move on to our final game of the week, and honestly, the direction that our future is headed, with Tamashi Chronicles of Ascent. Which is so hard for me to say Chronicles and not finish with Dumbledore, but I held it together for you all. <laughs> and I really thought I would have to do a Five Reasons You Shouldn't Back just based on the strength of the Awaken Realms brand, but it's been stalled at 530,000 euros for weeks, and it's never gonna recover. I mean, it still do have a week to finish, and it'll probably get to, I don't know, 700, 800, thousand euros by the end. But I can honestly see why it hasn't broken that one million dollar barrier because the reception to this one has just been eh, fine. But I don't think this Candy Crush style puzzle is resonating with everyone. And I do really like the altered carbon nature of being able to teleport your consciousness into different bodies. I think that 
is a really cool idea, but I think that also might suit a legacy style campaign a little bit better. That when you use up one of these characters, they're gone and you cannot use them for the rest of the campaign. And you're discovering bodies, more and more bodies as you progress through the campaign. I, I don't know if that's what they're planning or not, but I think it seems like everything's going to still be available to everyone. And the other thing about this campaign that I hate is that they do not have their rulebook on the main page, but it was in their day one update instead. And yeah, that's great. Wait to release your rulebook until the campaign's launched. Like that's cool and release it and show it in that day one update so that people who have backed can know what they're backing. But when you don't put it onto the main page and maybe I just missed it, you lose credibility, at least with me. Now, likely it is because Awakened Realms rulebooks are notoriously horrible and this is still in a draft phase. And you don't want to lead with that. You want to lead with all these cyberpunk art and minis. And yeah, I get that. I understand the choice, but the less generous interpretation of this choice is that, yeah, we don't want to give wide access to our rulebook because it isn't anything to write home about. I'm not saying that it it necessarily isn't, or that this was the intention behind it, but that's the vibe that it potentially gives off. And honestly, this rulebook is just about as good as all the other rulebooks on their finished games. So, but there still are minor questions that come up in my brain that aren't really answered, even while I'm looking through, combined with their wholly unhelpful <laughs> final page describing the locations where you have to zoom in to even see the blurry outline of what the tile says and what it is describing. I don't know, and maybe it's just coming from the bag building system of Orléans 175 versus this bag building then token manipulation system, but this one doesn't seem as exciting. I think I know which one I prefer and sounds more interesting. I mean, I do think it's somewhat interesting that the enemies attach themselves to your specific character board and don't appear on the main map. Although if this were an Awakened Realms title and not just an Awakened Realms light title, well, you know that there would be an optional mini add-on that you could just put next to your piece and you'd move them all at the same time. <laughs> it may seem like I'm being harsh, and I'm not. I, I, or I don't mean to be. It's just that I'm not particularly wowed by anything that is in the rulebook or that has been currently presented. And honestly, I've backed enough Awakened Realms games on faith alone that I haven't yet made my way through. Again, I mean, I think their scenario card idea is interesting that you can do the scenarios in whatever order that you want, but you can also do that in any scenario-based game. It's called just opening the rulebook to a random page and picking that one. <laughs> because the story really doesn't feel like it's going to be exceptionally huge in this one. And I may be wrong, but maybe I also just now know what to expect from an Awakened Realms story. And it's good, I, I enjoy it, but I've often whipped myself up into a frenzy over it, and now I can just say, yeah, it'll probably be, be fine. It'll probably be good, slightly better than fine. <laughs> but it's 66 euros or $90 Canadian plus 25 euros in shipping. I need it to be a little bit more than just above fine. So if the things in it get you excited, that's great. Feel free to check it out. That finishes next Tuesday at 11 a.m. April the 5th. And that's it. That is it for the week. Every week I do a pick for me and a pick for you. Pick for me being the something that I am the most interested in, and the pick for you, I'm now changing it to what I want you to buy so that I can play it with you and not spend my money on it. <laughs> or no, the pick for you is generally what I think might have a more a wider appeal. And this is uh, this is a tough week. There were so many campaigns this week, and there were so many that I thought held a great deal of promise, but when I actually looked into the campaigns, not a lot clicked with me personally. I could manufacture a pick for me and a pick for you if I wanted to put Tiwanaku on this list, and, and honestly it could be. My worry with Tiwanaku is that the deduction itself, the, the manner in which you deduct, won't be as exciting the longer that you do it. With Cryptid, I'm excited every time, and I don't know if I would be as excited every time for the same reason that I dropped Sudoku because I got tired of making the same sort of pattern prediction. So I'm not sure about that. Tiwanaku could be my pick for me, but I'm not making it the pick for me. The pick for me is going to be Solar 175. Uh, I mean, I like Orléans. I like legacy games. This team I have faith in. It's just really expensive, so I'm, I'm not getting it. But this is the one that I am personally the most interested in because I can see the mechanics, I can see how 
the loop would feel and I think it would look good. So my official pick for me is Solar 175 and my pick for you is nothing. <laughs> it is, it is nothing. Uh, I, there's, there's nothing that, that I want to really recommend this week. And maybe that comes from doing this for a long while and thinking about how my sort of existence in the potential hype train, and maybe it's to cool those jets a little bit. And maybe I should be a little bit more discerning about the picks for you and the pick for me. But I, I just haven't seen enough from all the games that we've covered this week to make a, a specifically worthwhile recommendation. Even though there are some potential heavy hitters, I just think when I'm comparing them to the things that you could go and get at retail right now, which is what they should be compared against, we have an abundance of options. And just because it is on Kickstarter doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go and buy it. So my pick for you is have a nice meal. <laughs> That's my pick for you. My pick for you is join a Patreon. <laughs> no, my pick for you is, is don't get anything. My pick for you is go to your local game store and get that game that you've been thinking about more than backing something now that you'll only get in two years that you aren't really that excited about. That's my whole backing philosophy is you need to be excited about this. And if I'm not excited about many of these, I, I think Solar 175 looks cool. I do think it is a little bit on the pricey side for what you are getting. But if, if you're not excited about it, if I'm not excited about it, I'm not going to recommend it to you whatsoever. So yeah, no pick for you this week. I think I've only done that a uh, very few times and maybe this will balance out my tie that I had last week anyway. I have to I have to bring balance to the crowdfunding countdown and and perhaps I have done that now. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for sticking around. I'm sorry I feel bad that I didn't give you a pick for you because you've you made it all this way here and you want to have that final push, but I but I can't. Go to your local game store and get that get that game that you've been wanting. That's the pick for you. Uh, thank you everyone for sticking around. That's it. I gotta wrap this up and get to editing so it can be out tomorrow morning. But I am very appreciative and I enjoy spending this time with you every week. Let me know what upcoming is exciting. There are a lot of upcoming things that I think could be pretty cool that I am looking forward to taking a deep dive into and figuring out if they're going to be if I should be excited for them or if I'm just excited by the idea of them. Which is strangely what my, my girlfriend said to me uh, yesterday before she left the house and hasn't returned. That she liked the idea of... Oh no. Anyway, on that note, my name's Chris George and I don't have a catchphrase and I don't have any. I don't have a lot anymore. I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>